Hello, hi. I, I am Carl Rixenick. I am uh, with uh, the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. I'm going to talk about that. And I also have a spin out company uh, associated with the research that I did there at the university. The company is called Lapis, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, but before I get started, I had 10 minutes, so, but I have to plug the university. So as we start to think about AI, it's a huge topic. I've spent the last 30 years, believe it or not, 30 years in the area of AI. Uh, my first paper was in 1994, 93, yeah. And it happens to be on generative AI, but it was a term that wasn't even known at the time. So we were doing some really cool work as an undergraduate student, okay? Um, and we do a lot of really cool and interesting work at the university around the topic of AI. Um, and in particular, my specialty is around uh, face recognition and facial analytics. It's a field of study that actually got its foothold uh, here at UNCW. We're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about just general AI, but I'd love to talk to you a little bit about that um, later on. But as I'm talking about UNCW, and I'm promoting UNCW more than I'm promoting my company, that's because we are here to... Uh, facilitate entrepreneurship and my goal, my desire is to have more technology based companies in Wilmington. The university is a great place to bootstrap your technology based company. We have wonderful students, really smart faculty and staff and we have great programs for you. So let me tell you a little bit about the programs that we have that, that you know, focuses on AI. So in our computer science uh, program, we have a concentration on artificial intelligence. This concentration is equivalent to about a master's degree program at any other school in North Carolina. We also had a engineering program called Intelligent Systems Engineering, which blends engineering with an overlay of AI. You're working on hardware all the way over to software aspects of that. Uh, we have a master's in data science. We have a master's in business analytics. We also have a master's in statistics. All of these things are central to AI or machine learning. So let's learn about AI. Why don't you tell them the most famous investor that you have in Lapidus Solutions? Who's that? The duck. Oh, <laughs> well, well, yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about our, my investor class. Go ahead and we'll talk about Lapidus. So Lapis Solutions, what do we do? Uh, we are a really interesting company. Uh, we really focus on health intelligence and we focus on lifespan. And so our industry focus is in life insurance. And what we want to do is to be able to dramatically reduce the friction associated with purchasing of life insurance. How do we do that? Well, everybody has a camera, right, or a phone, right? We take a picture, and guess what we do with that picture? We analyze your health. We figure out things like your biological age, your body mass index, and something that's really on, their, uh, on the cutting edge. Uh, we can also do things like uh, detect blood pressure and things like that called reverse uh, remote visual photoplasmography. And there's some new work out that's looking at the correlation between your face and cancer. So that's really early work, and so this is where AI is going. AI will be in your health space. We also, our markets uh, are in India, South Africa, Japan. We're doing some stuff with uh, a large reinsurer called Jinri, which is one of the world's largest reinsurers. And that's in the MENA region, the Middle East in North Africa, and then North America. That's where we bring our technology back in North America. And some of the things that are really cool that we're doing is in financial services too, and life settlements, and then health insurance. Next slide, please. All right. Oh, what I forgot, sorry, go back. What I forgot to say is part of our investor group is Aflac. So that's what Jim wanted me to share with you guys. Uh, Aflac was an early investor in us. Uh, and we have some family funds from Europe that invest in, in us as well. So we are pretty much uh, global players as far as our investment arm is concerned. All right. So what is artificial intelligence? It is this huge umbrella term that captures 
anything that has to do with the mimicking of the capabilities of a human. And what do we do as humans? What is our, 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 our key thing? We see patterns. We pick out patterns. We understand things. That's how we understand, through patterns. Right? And so AI looks at this and it encompasses just a lot of different tools from statistical learning all the way over to what we see today, which is deep machine learning. So we're not going to talk about all aspects of artificial intelligence. It has been going on since the 1950s. The, the term artificial intelligence was coined in the 1960s. And from then, we've had different types of technologies that sort of led the way. What's really interesting is that we've had two winters in AI. And what that basically means is there was a huge promise of the capabilities of artificial intelligence. And then it died. And that happened twice. We will never see that happen again. We are firmly in the AI economy. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Right, next slide, please. All right. So before I can talk about this AI, I have to talk about sort of some categories associated with AI. So we have both strong AI and we have weak AI. Um, and so when we start talking about strong AI, this is kind of the thing of myth. We're not quite there yet. We made a huge inroad with these large language models uh, and the evolution of ChatGPT and some of these generative models. But we're not quite there yet as far as, you know, the Terminator taking over, uh, you know, everything. So general AI is the ability to mimic fully what humans are capable of doing. Right? So that, that is literally having a conversation with your AI as if you were dealing with a person. Now, I know that we could do some of these really cool and interesting things with ChatGPT and some of these large language models. They don't rise to that level just yet. And then we have the super intelligence. This is the scary thing. This is where AI can just, you know, completely dominate the human intelligence and in ingenuity, right? That not happening anytime soon. Next slide. Did you compete against the Terminator in one of your bodies? Uh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so narrow AI is where we reside today. We are in this, the, the, the realm of what we call weak AI or narrow AI. And that is inclusive of ChatGPT. So ChatGPT in, and these large language models is a a complex combination of different AI technologies that come together. And we're not going to go down there, but what I want you to walk away with is what amazing things we're doing with this whole narrow AI. This is the field that I work in, and I, most of my work was around biometrics and face recognition, and we did some really cool things. And now face recognition has been better than humans for the last 10 to 15 years. And now we're getting rates of almost like 99% when we're trying to match with face recognition and some of the other things. Okay, next. All right, so where do we see this whole weak AI or narrow AI? Well, we started with the personal assistants, Siri and Alexa, Google. The news feeds that you get from your favorite social media is an AI driven. Now, we can have a conversation about that because that's kind of wicked. Um, and some of the things that they drive us to, your spam filters. When you think about your self-driving cars, your lane keep, all of that is using, although it seems very sophisticated, weak AI. So you may be thinking, wow, you know, when we get to this stronger AI, what is life going to be like? Okay? Um, and so over here, we also have this whole field of generative AI. ChatGPT is one, Google's BART, Dolly for image generation. And with the generative AI, it really started in the area of imagery, the, the ability to create uh, imagery from uh, words or to mimic some capability of an artist. That's where we started. And now we have a lot of great power with the text-based uh, generative AI. Now, there are some issues with uh, generative AI, right? It hallucinates. It's like the tequila. 
we might have had too many shots of tequila and we think we saw something that we didn't, didn't actually see. Now, yeah, Jim knows that. So, but we can see that and that happens often with some of these, this technology and it's getting better. And the generative part basically means it has the capacity to create something new. And that's really dangerous when you're dealing in facts and research. So when you're thinking about utilizing the technology, you have to have a really brilliant, smart team that you're working with, like the guy who came before me, to help you to put this technology into play. Okay, next. All right. So I, I asked the, these various AIs, what are the big elements, big ideas out there? And so the three large areas of AI boil down to democratization of AI, the generative aspect, and AI for good. Democratization of AI basically means we are now allowing people to access the technology without any technical capability. Now, I had a job for a very long time because I was like the smart guy who knows how to you know, do these really cool and interesting things with AI, but guess what? My nine-year-old granddaughter can do things that I can't do, right? So it's amazing what this technology is doing. And it's spreading around the world. So if you want to know the biggest sort of um, area in which AI, uh, the, the largest sort of growth area for AI is actually in emerging countries, right? The work and the things that they're doing in these emerging cr countries with AI to solve their social issues is phenomenal. We don't get a chance to hear a, a lot about that, but I'm monitoring those things, and it's, I mean, it's just incredible what you're seeing out there, okay? Generative AI I just spoke about just a little bit. It has the capacity to create something from a lot of representations and to build it new. So we have this capability, uh, you know, where it can, you know, in some cases hallucinate or, you know, in some other cases, it may just spit back the data back to you in a way that uh, you may not want, okay? And then AI for good, this is basically how we use AI to help our sort of society. And there's a lot of great use cases of AI for good that's out there. And so if you're thinking about utilizing AI for good, uh, you know, please come see me. All right, next one. So, this, slot, this, this, this chart is just showing you the investments associated with AI. So one of the things that frightened me over the years, the many years, was sort of China was investing a lot more money in AI than we were, all right? But from this slide, what you'll see is that there is substantial U.S. investment. So China, as a, as a group, was investing a lot of money. Our government wasn't per se, investing a lot of money. But corporations are now investing a tremendous amount of their wealth uh, into AI. And what you'll see is that in 2024, there's going to be about a $65 billion investment in AI just in the US alone. So as you're thinking about your next startup, it should have something to do with AI, because that's where you're going to find the funding and the money to promote that, right? So the investment focus is on these four areas, which are companies that develop AI models. That's individuals like myself, you know, and all of the academics that are out there. Um, companies that supply the infrastructure. This is like the Amazons of the world and the Microsofts of the world who have the data centers and the compute power. And then we have those software companies that deploy AI to solve a problem. All right, and then enterprises that figure out how to use it and capitalize on it. So those are the four investment focuses for AI. All right, next. And so I thought I'd add this, and if you want, you can take a little picture of this. This is put out by Price Waterhouse, and it shows sort of where these investments and focuses and where the uh, sort of technology is for various different areas. You sim simply select the area, and it'll tell you about sort of the impacts of AI uh, across the data that's available for it 
and the investment time frame associated with it. So if you, if you just take a, uh, a picture of this, you can pull this uh, PwC uh, article up and learn a lot more about the industries and the needs in those particular industries. All right. Next. And so I came back and I said, I wanted to ask, well, Jim said, what are the three sort of big ideas for AI? So of course, I have my thoughts. And then I said, well, let's see what ChatGPT says. And then we're going to see what Bard says. So ChatGPT says, federated learning and decentralization of AI. What does that really mean? Well, we have companies, especially the social media companies and the Amazons of the world that have been stealing our data and creating really cool and interesting things. Well, that's not happening anymore, okay? So federated AI basically is, you know, the ability for you to keep your data, okay, and still be able to utilize your data to, um, you know, create something new and interesting. So it's the sort of keeping of your data and not having it sort of ripped from you or stolen from you. That's what we mean by federated AI and decentralized. The next one is explainability, and that's not what we have today. So we have some great tools, but it's not explainable. We cannot sit there and interrogate and say, why did you come up with that particular answer? Especially on this narrow AI right now. So that's a big field. Uh, it's getting a lot of research um, and a lot of money. And then ChatGPT4 says, human AI collaboration and augmentation. This is what you see AI being used for uh, within our law enforcement and within our military. There's always a human in the loop where there should be, uh, a human in the loop to ensure that the AI doesn't go astray, and it can. Because guess what? We don't know when it breaks, right? It just does, right? Uh, next one, okay. All right, so Bard said, and I, I'm kind of liking Bard over ChatGPT, just as an FYI. Uh, but Bard says federated learning, multimodal learning. So multi, excuse me, multimodal was what uh, the last presenter was talking about. Not only can you provide it some text, you can give it some imagery and some, and some, um, and some video and ask it to analyze that. Potentially even audio files and ask it to analyze that. And that's where we're getting at with multimodal AI. And then the third thing, of course, is explainable AI, right? Uh, can we keep it down in the back, please? Yeah, last slide. All right. Yeah, go ahead. All right, so I'm ready for some questions. And if you're interested, uh, you can hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, here's my URL code. And some of the things that I also do is I help companies uh, uh, who are looking for AI resources. Uh, I'm helping one company here. Susie over there, helping them to find some uh, AI, AI talent that's going pretty well. And I think they're about to do some really amazing things now that they're bringing in their AI team. And I also do some uh, consulting on solving your particular problems utilizing AI. Question? Well, let me, so in general, AI can be biased. It's based on the data that you present it. It's just like humans. I often walk people through a example of what machine learning looks like. Uh, I didn't bring that today, it's really cool. Um, but if we present data to our machine and say, learn this, and if that data has some bias associated with it, regardless of what that bias is, that's the pattern that it's going to learn. Now, large language models, because they are large and they're, they're, they're boiling the ocean, uh, they will have bias, but I'm hoping that it won't be as, as bad. And they're working really hard, I know OpenAI is, to sort of uh, constrain that bias. But it is a reflection of our society, to be quite honest with you. Because where does the data come from, right? 
So we're cleaning that up. So yes, there is some bias. And I just told you about face recognition, for example. 99.3% accurate according to NIST, but it's not as accurate on me or someone with a darker complexion. Right? Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. So as a software investor, every pitch we see now has some component of AI in it. And it's moved from being a differentiator to just the price of admission to yeah. have a pitch. What would you recommend to entrepreneurs that are have some AI component to kind of cut through the noise that it's an actually differentiated solution and something real that has real value and it's not just another run of the mill running stuff through. Right. So when we did our initial pitch uh, and got funding for it uh, some seven years ago, eight years ago now, there was no mention of AI in our in our pitch at all, right? I'm doing things with the face. I'm extracting health information from it. I didn't spend time saying this is AI and this is how I do it. I talked about the use case and how it's going to move the needle for that pain point. And that pain point for us was life insurance companies who took 45, 90, 135 days before they return an answer to you. When you could do that in 4.5 seconds right? By uploading a picture. I would tell entrepreneurs, it is, it is understood that you're going to be leveraging this technology, but that cannot be the center of your pitch. All right, sir? Oh yeah, so I don't know if people are familiar with the Tesla robotic driving, so the AI driving. Yes. Okay, oh, that's a great question, uh, and here's how I'm going to put it. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so the question is, why is AI driving uh, behind the curve relative to what we see with these large language models, right? Yep. I, I captured that. Yep. And so I'm going to answer this a little, um, a little differently. Well, why does autopilot suck? Yeah, well, so I'm going to disagree with you. I think it's awesome. And I, the reason I think it's awesome and the capabilities are phenomenal is because I've worked in that particular space, the computer vision space, for a long time. One of the first things that uh, I did as a graduate student, not using cameras, but just to teach my car how to auto park, right? Just that sort of thing. And it wasn't a car, it was a virtual thing, how to back up, turn into these things. That was back in 1995. My Genesis out there, I push a button, and I drive, and it says, stop, I'll park you here. I'm blown away. That's amazing. Lane keep, when you think about all of the parameters that go into understanding what a lane is, especially in Wilmington, where some of these lanes, <laughs> we, we don't have the best sort of, you know, sort of streets in Wilmington, and they get sort of confused, right? And the ability for the car to even start to drive around a curve is just amazing to me. Now, I understand that you want more, and there's huge investments. And over time, those investments are going to produce, and we're going to have what we would eventually have this sort of true self-driving car. Now, we have different versions of that, and I think there are five categories associated with self-driving cars. We're somewhere around the 2-3 mark uh, today. Now, with large language models, it's a bit different, right? The capability when it came out just blew people away. The problem in comparing those two is I can put anything or ask the large language models anything, it's not going to kill me. When I'm driving down the street, right, and my car gets a little wonky, you know, that could be death, right? So. We can leave the large language models kind of wide open. We have to constrain over here further, okay? Um, and I think that's what we see. Now, the technology for la large language models is amazing. It's 
otherworldly. When you start to peel back the onion and understand how it works, and we think it's just super simplistic. But these feedback um, loops that they have in it is incredible. And how you take the data that you're getting into you um, and then retraining uh, this AI is incredible. And it takes a lot of manpower. So I think if we put the same level of manpower that we have with these humans out here uh, on the large language model side of the house and we put it into driving and we kind of open the doors up and, and, and allow that data to, to flow freely, then we would solve a lot of those problems. Tesla has tremendous amount of data uh, and several other companies, but they don't share that data out. And academics like me can get access to it, right? So we can't try to make improvements. We can't teach our students to work on that and get better. But guess what? You have most of the large language model stuff, a lot of really good stuff is open source. Okay, that's a risk. Oh, sorry. <laughs>